The 805 Focus is brought to you in part by Nonprofit Connect. Nonprofit Connect provides superior leadership tools and resources so nonprofit leaders and board members can make valuable decisions to move their organization forward to a sustainable and vibrant future. More information on services online at nonprofitconnect.org. Welcome to 805 Focus. I'm Dr. Cinder Sinclair with Nonprofit Connect, and we will be bringing you the latest on your favorite nonprofits. So get ready to be inspired. Our special guest today is Rebecca Anderson, and Rebecca is Executive Director of Lotus Land. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Cinder. Thanks for being with us. It's my pleasure. Oh, Lotus Land is such a beautiful place. I've been there many times, and it seems like every time I, I had to make a reservation. Are, is that still true these days? It's still true. In fact, it's a little more true than ever. Um, as you know, during the pandemic, gardens mm -hmm. and outdoor spaces became in demand as an alternative as indoor museums yeah. and other activities were closed. And so we've always had a waiting list and, and a lot more interest than our county permit allows us to accommodate. But particularly now, more than ever, we're asking people to plan four to six weeks in advance of a visit. Wow, because it's so popular. Because it's so popular, and part of that has to do with the release of our new book, which I know we'll talk about shortly. Um, but with that, the visibility has been raised. You know, sometimes people in Santa Barbara are unfamiliar with Lotus and it always surprises me locally, but I think now uh, word is getting out about this community treasure uh, beyond even our little community. And so um, does the county give you a certain kind of number of people that you're allowed in some given amount of time or how does that work? Yeah, there are a whole host of rules and restrictions that we subscribe to and that came from being in a residential neighborhood when oh. we opened. It took nine years and 64 public hearings for the County Board of Supervisors to actually agree to having a botanical garden in a residential neighborhood. And so we opened in 1993. Next year will be our 30th anniversary. Wow. And we've been dancing with this limit ever since. It's so, tricky. Yeah. So it's you don't have a choice. It's not like, oh, you're some exclusive place. You're trying to, you, you want to bring as many people in as you can, but you are operating with these restrictions. You have it numbers. exactly right. So we often feel that there's this myth about Lotus Land that we're exclusive by design or being in Montecito. And in fact, the opposite is true. We would love to share the garden more widely we are challenged by a very restrictive number. So we are allowed 15,000 visitors a year. And just to give some context to that, our friends at the zoo can have almost 500,000. Holy cow. You know, it just, so it's like a week's worth of visitors to a bigger institution would be something that we would have all year. It's really, really small in terms of our, our numbers. And there's a few things to that. The upside, of course, is it feels like the most private public garden there sure. is. The downside is we struggle every year to make ends meet because our admissions only generate about 10% of our operating budget. Oh gosh. So that means we are hustling um, to think of creative ways mm -hmm. to raise money to allow the garden to be here, not only now, in kind of this annual model, yeah. um, but really for the long haul. Gosh, so so you really rely a lot on uh, donations. We really rely a lot on donations, and fortunately, we have a membership program okay. where we have members who are using the garden. They enjoy the access, but they're also philanthropic memberships. So we have our garden circles, and those are people who are are giving to sustain and support the garden as well as oh, enjoy it. 
Um, and then we do fundraising events. We have our big summer gala that many people enjoy yeah. and know about called Lotus yeah. Land Celebrates. This year, we're doing an event around the release of the new book and raising attention uh, of the garden and our reputation in kind of the global botanic garden community. And then we do other events in October. We have a really fun fundraiser called the Exceptional Plant Auction and mm -hmm. Sale. And so we have rare plants that either are gifted to us or that we propagate and cultivate, and we sell them. So you can end up with plants from Lotus Land or plants from really unique and special growers in your own garden. That's pretty exciting. It's really fun. It's and fun. so, um, you really rely on donations, financial donations, and so a person can go on your website, for example, and hit that Donate Now button. Yep, you can help us by going online and giving. You can also help us by, if you have an interest in kind of learning more about a certain area, we do sustainable horticulture, so mm -hmm. there's a whole initiative and programming around sustainability. You can give to support that. We have education programs for uh -huh. school children. You can go and support that. And those we subsidize 100%. So if people are coming to the garden with their classroom, we're paying for the children's admission, the chaperone's admission, and the teachers. We're paying for the transportation. We give yeah. them an activity guide, and we actually give each child who oh. visits a succulent, and Sweet. we tell them that they're a junior botanist now, and they have a responsibility to care for their plant, and by doing so, they're caring for the earth. Uh. And, and raising awareness of what it means to be mindful of plants in their lives and in their, their homes and their community. I bet those kids get excited about that. Not only do they get excited, but they come back as adults. So oh. we have a lot of mm. stories now that we've been doing this for 30 years. And they say, I came in fourth grade. I was so inspired either by seeing that this could be a line of work that I could mm -hmm. participate in or by the beauty of the garden. We've had people become landscape designers and architects and come back and talk about that. Gosh. And um, not to mention, you know, biologists, botanists, horticulturalists. Yeah, I can just see all these fourth graders running around with this sweet little plant, telling their mom and dad and their friends, look what I got. It's so fun. During COVID, we weren't able to have classrooms come mm -hmm. in together. So we invited students to get out from their Zoom classes and computers, come with their parents. Uh -huh. So we adapted the program model. We called it the Junior Botanist Program. And they came and they led their parents through or their caregiver on a scavenger hunt. And they were still able to be in nature and off of screens, which is really what that we're going great. for. Yeah. And so while someone is on your website, and there, uh, can you make a reservation? On you the make, yes. Yeah, so okay. in February, for the first time ever, in, in really it was amazing, in almost 30 years, it used to be a phone call. And I'm oh. very proud of the fact that we've just launched online reservations. Oh, great. Yeah. So go on the website. A person can make a reservation when they're going to come. Yep. They can find out um, about making a donation. They can uh, find out about volunteering or getting involved in any of the programs there? We always are looking for volunteers. So I want to do a shout out to Santa Barbara and our community and say, if you are looking for a place to spend your days that is the most glorious place around, it will reward you to no end. We have incredible volunteers who work in the garden, who work for us helping with events, and then who lead tours. Mm. Another really exciting thing that happened for us during COVID um, that was kind of a challenge turned into an opportunity is we always do a docent training course that's very comprehensive. It's like a 17 week wow. deep dive into all of the botany of the gardens, the background, the biodiversity, and we train our docents to lead tours. And our docent tours had to be suspended. Our volunteer force was down. We didn't have uh, the level of comfort at the beginning of the pandemic that we could deliver that program safely. Yeah. And so we created a whole self-guided model. But with that, we still needed bodies in the garden to communicate and to inform our guests. So now we have a new volunteer role called garden attendant. Mm -hmm. And there's really a much lower kind of threshold to participate, which is great. We do do training, but it's not quite as intensive. 
So if people are interested, um, I encourage them to go on the website and yeah. get in touch with our All volunteers. right. Well, let, let's talk about this book. I'm going to hold it up here. It is a big, gorgeous book called Lotus Land. Yes, thank you. It is a labor of love, and I want to give all of the credit to, um, to others. We had board members who really had identified the need for a, a beautiful calling card for the garden, and this is it. So they put together not only the creative team to execute the book in conjunction with our staff, but the, the financial backing. Oh which was significant. So they went out to subscribers and they said, would you help us by underwriting the publishing of this book? Mm -hmm. And we had 15 people who stepped up and they did. And this is the beautiful result. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary. So if you've experienced the garden, you see it in detail. And if you haven't, you get to be kind of an armchair traveler. And so I think you said, People come from all over the world to go to Lotus Land. We do. So most of our visitation is from our community in Southern California, but we certainly have a reputation as one of the best gardens in the world. And um, we actually just had Jane Polly in the garden last week filming CBS This Morning, and I think our global audience is going to skyrocket. Oh and the book has really contributed to a number of publications um, covering this beautiful place. So more and more we see people planning travel around their visit to Lotus Land. Oh, well it's good, that, good yeah. for our economy too. I'd here say, locally. Yeah, 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 that is great. So um, I is there any chance that the county would increase the numbers? I mean, 15,000 is so low. You know, during COVID, we went back to the county and we said, if we keep up at this rate, we're gonna to have to close mid-year because we'll run out of spaces, even with our daily allotments. And we were able to file for an emergency ordinance that's mm -hmm. the same thing that's allowing the parklets and you know, taking up parking and the sure, sure. you know for-profit businesses. Um, so we're actually in a nice space right now where we have a little more freedom and flexibility about our, our hours and our use. It's still, everybody is off the property at desk and there's no amplified sound you know there's a lot of things that we we adhere to um, but it has been a nice test to say how, how would it feel if this were a little more relaxed so i i think that there's um an intention there you know a goodwill mm -hmm. there and it's going back through the process of an application mm -hmm. and all of that so we are you know always looking at that well, and you know, you, you, for all intents and purposes, set a precedent, and so maybe that would help encourage them to increase the numbers because obviously it's working well. And the thing is, we are are a small kind of community space that um, is mindful of our neighbors and our neighborhood, so we would never want anything exorbitant. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Gosh, well, I am so impressed with this book. How long did it take you to put this together? Took about two years, which mm. actually, you know, was pretty efficient. The photographer is a woman named Lisa Romarian, mm -hmm. and she's done a number of other shelter kind of publications and books. She's very talented, and this was really an art piece for her. I so she see came that. on five different dates from the minute the sun rose to the sunset, and she photographed the garden. And originally they thought, we'll do these three gardens on this date and those four gardens on this date. And it didn't happen that way at all. Because yeah. of course you're walking around and you see, oh, there's this beautiful blossom here. Or the light is captured through the cacti there. And so she, um, I think she broke all the rules and she just created a masterpiece. So when you think about, so Lotus Land is a botanic garden. When you think about that, how is Lotus Land different from most other botanic gardens or other botanic car gardens around the country? Or it's a great question. Um, I am immersing myself in this botanical garden world, and inevitably, when I talk to people at other gardens, they say, "Oh, Lotus Land is you know my favorite, one of my favorites," and it's because it's so 
unique as an artist's garden. Oh. So our creator, Ghana Walska, came into a property that was originally native land, um, chaparral, mm -hmm. oak trees. Um, you can imagine the landscape before any of Montecito had been developed. And then in the 1880s, there was a nurseryman on the property named Ralph Kenton Stevens, and he created um, palms and citrus mostly, although he experimented with a whole host of other plants. But he found that everything grew there, and he was growing these specimen plants for sale. So we have seed catalogs dating back to 1893. God. We actually have reproduced them, so they're really fantastic, and you can get them in our garden shop. But you can see that things have grown there successfully for more than 100 years. And so we have mature plants. And when people enjoy the garden, it's one of the things that they say sets it apart from other gardens is the scale of these really beautiful, tremendous towering trees. And you know, you feel like it's a nature's cathedral. It's, it's so established. Yeah. And then Ghana came in in 1941 she bought the property and she spent the second half of her life there she died in 84 and she went systematically garden by garden creating these whimsical themed gardens and she put her decorative arts kind of embedded in them so there's statuary and tile and collections she was quite a collector of plants but also of beautiful objects and when you go into these gardens they're immersive, mm -hmm. and then you go leave one and walk right into the next, and it's like an entirely different experience. So I think it's very unique and, and different than most botanic gardens. And you said even the way that she planted, what, what did you say, the same species? Like so she did these mass plantings, which you see a lot now. It's a trend now. At the time, it wasn't really done where you would have hundreds of one plant, but not only that, because she had this collector's gene, she would have diversity of species that she worked really hard to collect, you know, pre-internet, pre-catalogs, in a way where she was writing and corresponding with people across the planet, even before some of the current stipulations about um, cross-border mm -hmm. plant mm -hmm. trade were instituted. And we have correspondence and receipts of her amassing the variety in each garden. So you can go into our bromeliad garden and find within 300 yards a density of species that would never occur in the wild that way. And it mm. knocks your socks off. Wow. It's really quite spectacular. Yeah, that is quite a, a story. She, she was so creative and unique. She was creative, she was unique. She called herself an enemy of the average. Oh, <laughs> that's And good. I love that because it really was against all of the conventions of landscape design. We have correspondence from Lockwood DeForest who she hired uh, when she landscaped the front of the home, which is now our administrative office, but it, it's a Reginald mm -hmm. Johnson, beautiful piece of historic architecture and she put cacti and euphorbia, all of these plants that weren't seen as appropriate for the front of a home. Mm. They're prickly, they're not welcoming. Yeah. And he said, you know, I, I recommend you don't do that. And of course she did it anyway. <laughs> and then he complimented her after the fact and said, you were right, you know, you, you have been so successful here. Wow. So how can a person get a copy of this book? It is at all of our local booksellers. I'm so oh, pleased right. and proud to promote um, our, our independent businesses, Chaucer's and Book Den and Porch and Carpinteria, uh, Botanic. So please um, go to your Tecolote bookseller. Oh, good, They're good. all our friends and we want them to, to have lots of success with it. We sell it as well, mm -hmm. but again, our um, we don't allow our shop to be open to the general public. So you have to be on a tour to shop in our garden shop. You can also go online. We do have a Lotus Land garden shop that is beautifully uh -huh. curated and you can buy the book there too. We'll ship it to you. So let's talk about tours. So um, we don't have a whole lot of time left. Okay. But so I, if I make a, a, a reservation, for example, am I reserving that spot for a tour or do I just show up and just walk around wherever I want? Or you what? can do either one. Oh, so okay. during the pandemic, we were doing self-guided tours, which was a walkabout with 
interactive mm -hmm. volunteers and then QR codes we put in the garden so people could get oh, some more information. That's a good idea. We've kept that available because we found about 50% of our visitors really like that experience. Yeah. Uh, we recommend, and I really do recommend, at least on your first visit, that you have a docent-led tour. Okay, They're that's free. Good. You can elect to make that choice yeah, when you yeah, book your reservation, sense. and you're guided by an extraordinary volunteer who will tell you uh, so much more than you would ever know if you were walking yeah. on your own. Rebecca, thank you so much for all of this wonderful work that you're doing in this beautiful, unique place. Thank you, Cinder. And for being on our show to tell us all about it. It's a pleasure. I thank you for the invitation. Yeah. And thank you for joining us on 805 Focus, and we'll see you next time.